So hi everyone, uh, my name is Umu and uh, I guess thinking about the Brixton Black, Women, Black Women's Group, my work has mainly been focused on exploring, oh can you guys hear me? <laughs> exploring um, histories from the Olive Morris collection at Lambeth Archive. Um, and I guess how heavily Olive features or featured in your talk will feature in mine as well kind of speaks to how much work has gone to preserve that story and perhaps the work that is still pending to be done to entrench the stories of others who were also around. But I suppose in that way, the Olive Morris collection has given us a bit, me anyway, a bit of an anchor from which to manoeuvre. Um, so Olive Morris being a grassroots community activist and a founding member of the Brixton Black Women's Group, uh, my research, uh, based in an academic setting, has used Olive's archival story to kind of question the representation and space that we give to figures of blackness, both within ourselves and within broader institutions. But also in a more creative setting, I've made um, an experimental audio documentary titled Voices of the Archive that weaves together oral histories found in the Olive Morris collection to reimagine Olive's story through community voices. Um, and I'm going to share some of that audio work throughout my presentation. So like many black British figures, Olive is really hard to come across. Um, were it not for Elizabeth Obi, a uh, fellow Brixton Black Women's Group member uh, and close friend of Olive, um, and somebody called Ana Laura Lopez de la Torre, who founded the Remembering Olive Collective in 2008, Olive's, Olive's legacy might have remained... Uh, largely in the memory of those who knew her, much like many other important figures from the time. Um, the results of this work was, yes, the 2009 opening of the Olive Morris Collection at Lambeth Archive, uh, which is a sort of historical and visual record of Olive's lives tied together by these very rich uh, oral histories taken from those who knew her, including fellow women's group members, uh, family members, and other influential people from the community. So in that way, I kind of always feel a bit misplaced to speak about Olive Morris because everything that I've learned about her, I've learned through the work of other people. And I think that speaks to the immense labor of communities like the Remembering Olive Collective to preserve and entrench their own legacies, to refuse to let them be mistranslated or to refuse that assumption of their silence and invisibility. So throughout my presentation, I'll share some of the clips of these oral histories to introduce us to Olive so that we might better participate in that collective uh, memory making that really brings her as a figure back to life. So uh, born in Jamaica in 1952, Olive moved to London age nine. Her, her journey through activism began with the Black Panther Youth League and continued through central contributions to squatters movements. Uh, as a community activist, she was a founding member of not just the Brixton Black Women's Group, but also the Organisation for Women of African and Asian Descent. While studying for a degree in social sciences at Manchester University, she continued her, her community activism. She made a visit to China due to her interest in socialism and was an involved member of the Manchester Black Women's Mutual Aid Group. So, so often when researching black historical figures, we're left with remnants from which to piece together a story or a representation, when really we have no idea if the way we present these legacies would ring true for the people that we're speaking about. Uh, we're kind of forced to make assumptions and add interpretations to the material, and it's tempting to try to neatly summarize uh, her in a definition or some moment that I can use to present to you as an example of her impact. And in the first audio clip I play, we'll hear her sister, Jennifer Lewis, and a friend of hers, Anise, remember some of that impact. She was having some problems getting some benefit. And she went and had a big row with them, and she came back saying that, I can't believe how they're treating me, and I, I began to harass her. Olive's way of dealing with things was just confront people straight on. And she said, if you don't give my money, I'm going to stand here and get undressed, you see. So, so she's telling me that she was threatened to do this, and began taking her clothes off, and it's all right, all right, all right. So she'd like that, just in your face, you know. And very, very funny like that. So, um, 
I moved into a spot we found Dalberg Road, and we were only there a little while before they evicted us. And there's a phone box out the road, I'll just phone us as quick, you've got to come home because they've come to evict us. She came riding up on her bicycle to evict us off them, but they wouldn't stop because we had no right really to be there, so we were evicted. Only to go and find another spot. <laughs> she went and found another one right that evening. The, the most good image I think I have of her is when she took on that guy. Um, so, yeah, it's just one kind of example of how the archive is really full of all these different moments of humour, of activism and friendship from different moments of her life. And what I found through all these different stories uh, in my journey to kind of weave together components of the archive, hoping to sort of strengthen my grasp on her story, it's like the deeper I got, it's the harder she kind of uh, became, she became kind of harder, not easier to define. Um, for example, she's often described as highly driven and dedicated to her people, fearless in the face of injustice, yet people always discuss how she wasn't perfect. She clearly wasn't shy of discomfort as a mechanism for change. Uh, Diane Watt, a member of the Black Women's Cult in Manchester, describes with laughter in a quote, Olive wasn't scared of her power. That's what she engaged with, the power within. She was not a saint, because she told it as it is. Because sometimes it was like, oh, there's Olive. I think I'll disappear. Because <laughs> it's like, this person is going to see through me. So I can't blag it. You can't blag her. Elsewhere, I learned how Olive had a long-term white partner who at one point she had to get the approval of from the British Black Panther Party. <laughs> and, <laughs> and according to her partner, during this time, she also had intimate relationships with other people. Uh, additionally, she had a difficult relationship with her parents, which meant she left home when she was 16 and, like many others, began squatting, not just as a political act, but as a need. And I think what's interesting in the oral histories is that these moments of what she did, her activism, squatting and community, community work, are really inseparable from the personal, internal and informal impact that she had, the mistakes that she made, um, the kind of person that she was. And many people who gave oral histories don't speak so much about what she did. They speak, speak a lot about who she was to them. As a figure, I was kind of struck by how deeply her legacies perforate the memories and textures of her community. As we listen to the oral histories, we can hear in the background, say, the sound of a kettle or the ticking of a clock or the ringing of a phone in a way that Olive almost becomes embedded into their everyday lives. And really, how else could we understand these histories where they're not ha found in institutions or they're erased in public settings, these legacies are often carried, often made in the memories, photographs, homes of individuals in these inevitably quite personal and intimate spaces, which carries a complexity and a humanity with it. So through this archival knowledge, we're opened up to understandings of black ways of knowing that are really dripping in memory, texture, knowledge, uh, nostalgia, grief, and loss. Because sadly, Olive's life was cut short. In 1979, aged just 27, Olive passed away from a year-long battle with uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which is, I think, quite an aggressive form of cancer. Now, this scared her. In one oral history, she rec recounts to a friend that she didn't wish, wish to die, that she was too young. In another, her partner recounts how she was dedicated until she died, caring for others on the ward like a nurse herself. While her sister tells us that she used to say she didn't used to think she'd live to be 30, and that was even before she was diagnosed. So we really have this person in flux and conflicted, and the variety in the oral history accounts of her only really complements the varieties that were found in Olive. And allowing that messiness to exist is really the nature of allowing someone to be a human, which isn't an allowance often made for black women. The community grieved for Olive. Um, the day of her funeral, her brother, Basil Morris, remembers 
The traffic in South London came to a standstill that day. We had people coming down by the coach load. And you can hear more of the breadth of her impact in the next clip, the almost mythical memorialization of her funeral in their archival consciousness. No, it was, I think it was, it was a coach load of us that went down. People from the other assembly went. My husband went. I don't remember how few. Traffic in South London came to a standstill that day. That was one of the biggest humans ever. Must have been about two or three hundred people. I was surprised the people who were there. The people coming down coastal from Birmingham and Manchester and Sheffield. The raving crew, the gangster. There was a cancer. Yeah. One of Olive's favourite tunes was the East is Red. Political ones, the academics. You had all sorts of people. Yeah, what well, day that was. 30 years. 30 years this year. She went out of school. Seems like they yesterday to me. Yeah. 1979. So, a few years after Olive passed, in 1986, she was memorialised with the naming of Olive Morris House by Lambeth Council a building then demolished and rebuilt within the last two years. This building is used as a civic centre, a place for local people to make inquiries about council tax, benefits and other state allowances. And while Olive herself, Olive herself was a squatter, was highly critical and resistant to state mechanisms, her brother suggests she might have had her name taken off this building if she could, a building that she viewed could be oppressive to local people. So. In Olive, there's sometimes this kind of doubling sense of loss where she not only dies very, very young, but continues to face challenges of erasure and misrepresentation in the present. And her retelling in the archive carries the personal weight of that loss. It's a feeling many marginalised people would be familiar with. The burden of being forced to exist against attention, against the tension of state-sanctioned erasure and oppression. An erasure which means that well-documented factual histories are not always possible to find in a system which teaches us to only value and legitimize things that can be proven and factual. So how can we attempt to counter the invisibility of black histories when they are forced to exist in the vacuum between that dichotomy? And in some ways, that's the question the Remembering Olive Collective set out to answer when they titled their oral history project, Do You Remember Olive Morris? It's a question that speaks not just to Olive's erasure, but to our own erasure as well, to the broader erasure of black voices. I think it's important to note how that loss, uh, that vacuum, it doesn't necessarily define these narratives, and it, it never really did. That loss isn't the end point of Olive's story. Through the Remembering Olive Collective, many people were allowed to collectively express their memories of Olive, their grief for her, their loss, have that, uh, have that grief acknowledged and legitimized as opposed to shied away from, have that grief become something new, given to the archive so that others can partake in it. And I think that transformation is a huge, huge strength of this legacy. I think if we tried to translate these histories into traditions that favored fact and coherence over emotion and meaning, we would leave parts of them behind. Uh, this feeling is explored in the closing sequence of our audio documentary. I, I just found her a very broad, she wouldn't want to be, she didn't want to be boxed in. Um, Did anybody forget her? Um, <laughs> she was a character. She was. Yes. Well, she was a very genuine person. A great digger. She was 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 a great digger. Very difficult to imagine her being anything other than a militant community. Very brutal. 
So in the archive, Olive is sort of transferred from a bordered person to a collective body. And where many of these perspectives overlap, some of them are very different. Notably, as Olive passes through Changing Hands, her story is continually added to by the story, the surrounding, the lives and experiences of every person who speaks of her. All these additional narratives spill out of this space that wasn't intended to hold them. And I'm curious to know what happens when we allow those spillages to decide how we write and think about things going forwards. I suppose when we talk about Olive Morris as a legacy of the Brixton Black Women's Group, I think about Olive not just as an individual example of exceptionalism or exceptional activism, but Olive as a collective existence, a collective contribution that counters the individualizing nature of racial marginalization in Britain. This thinking destabilizes the boundaries within and between subjects, generating possibilities for collective address of legitimacy found in connecting across shared story, not in spite of, but indifferent to erasure. In many ways, it's possible to lean into that unboundaried expression of history, seeing that uncertainty as a sense of freedom, notably amidst her life, death and reliving, the archive generates a feeling of Olive. And in that intangibility, these legacies become exponentially powerful in a way that I think allows them to continue to reverberate after they've been spoken. It's in conversation with these histories and spaces that we continue to proliferate their legacies. Yeah, thank you, and looking forward to discussing it with you more.